science fantastic with professor michio kaku this is science fantastic with professor michio kaku on science fantastic we profile the amazing jaw-dropping scientific discoveries which are revolutionizing our world and touching our lives and in this hour we're going to bring on a special guest professor max tegmark of mit He's a physics professor, but he's interested in robots. Are they going to take over? Are they going to help us? What about the job market of the future? These are all questions that are mentioned in the book Life 3.0, Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. He's a professor of physics at MIT, author of the book Our Mathematical Universe, president of the Future of Life Institute. And today we're going to talk about the mythology, the facts, and what's really happening behind the artificial intelligence controversy. In fact, just recently, there was a battle that broke out between Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, and Elon Musk, founder of SpaceX, Tesla Motors, and PayPal. Battle of the billionaires, with Elon Musk saying, oh my God, the robots, they're getting smarter and smarter, and maybe one day they'll push us out of the way. This is an existential threat, said Elon Musk. Then along comes Mark Zuckerberg and says, Ha, come on, give me a break. Robots, they're stupid at the present time. However, artificial intelligence, yes. Software of the future will incorporate artificial intelligence. It'll make life easier. Life will be cheaper, better, more convenient. You'll simply talk to things and have all your wishes being carried out. You don't have to learn code. You don't have to push buttons. You simply talk to things. And they understand what you're getting at. So we had a battle between billionaires, and we'll ask Max Tegmark who's correct. And in the far future, we have movies like The Terminator, where the robots turn on us. And the question is, well, is that just Hollywood hype? Are they just trying to sell theater tickets to scare the pants off the viewers? Or are real scientists studying this? Okay, And then we'll talk about the singularity, the point at which robots will approach human intelligence. Some people say, ha, it's not going to happen for centuries. Other people say, no, it's around the corner. Well, let's ask a professor of physics at MIT the question, when might we attain human intelligence with machines in the laboratory? And, of course, there's a spectrum of views in the field. We've had a number of the leading figures in the debate talk about this question. So with us today is Professor Max Tegmark, who will give us his spin on the whole question. After we take a short commercial break and begin a discussion of Life 3.0, being human in the age of artificial intelligence. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. In this hour, we're going to continue our discussion of artificial intelligence. Robots, are they going to take over? Are they going to be our helpers? What does it mean to have an intelligent being made out of steel and plastic? And and, uh, what does it mean? How far advanced can robots become? With us today, once again, is Professor Max Tegmark, Professor of Physics at MIT, President of the Future of Life Institute, author of Our Mathematical Universe, and his new book, which is just coming out. His new book is called Life 3.0, Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. So, Max, once again, thank you so much for being on Science Fantastic. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay, the first question that we always ask our guests is, how did you, as a youth, think back now, how did you, as a youth, first get interested in science and then physics? I always used to be fascinated Ever since I was 10 or so, about it was really, really big questions. And it seemed to me when I was a teenager that the two biggest mysteries of all in science were the mystery about our universe out there and our universe in our heads, our minds. And uh, I've had a lot of fun studying the cosmos, sure enough, throughout much of my career. And in the last few years, I've gotten increasingly fascinated by AI and our inner universe and, and shifted my MIT research to very much focus on uh, artificial intelligence. Okay. 
And you probably heard about this debate between the billionaires, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg. They call it the Battle of the Billionaires. On one hand, we have Elon Musk, founder of SpaceX and PayPal and Tesla Motors, saying, watch out. Watch out. We have this existential threat from the robots. And then we have Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, another billionaire, who says, ha, come on, give me a break. Uh, we're, gonna, we're talking about a technology that's going to give us wealth. It's going to create jobs. It's going to open up society. It'll do so much good. So, first of all, what's your take about the so-called battle of the billionaires? <laughs> My take is that, yes, of course, <clears throat> I'm optimistic that AI can give us great wealth and help us solve uh, all the problems that stump us today with because of our limited intelligence but at the same time this is not something that's going to come automatically it's something that we really need to plan and work for because it also gives us like any technology the opportunity to screw up like never before and i think really fundamentally something that uh, zuckerberg maybe is not taking seriously enough is that we humans have traditionally thought of intelligence as something mysterious it can only exist in biological organisms, especially humans. But you know, from my perspective as a physicist, intelligence is simply a certain kind of information processing performed by elementary particles moving around according to the laws of physics. And you know, there's no law of physics that says that we can't build machines more intelligent than us in all ways. So I think we've only seen the tip of the intelligence iceberg and that there is an amazing potential to unlock the full intelligence that's latent in nature, and we can then choose to use that, you know, either to help humanity flourish or to screw up in new ways. Okay, well, full disclosure, let me give you my take on it, and then I'll ask you for your comments. I think that in the short term, I think Mark Zuckerberg has a point. Uh, robots are about as smart as a cockroach, uh, a retarded lobotomized cockroach. <laughs> They're not very smart at all. So the short term, we will see AI enter the marketplace, making life better, easier, cheaper, more convenient. We'll simply talk to things, and things will talk back to us rather than having to punch in things into our cell phone. However, on a scale of a few decades, uh, I think Elon Musk's point of view becomes very important. One of these days, robots are going to become self-aware. <clears throat> They'll have their own goals. And maybe those goals don't include us. Of course, they're not that smart yet. But on a scale of who knows for sure, 30, 40, 50 years, robots may gradually attain a certain amount of self-awareness, in which case they could pose an existential threat. But, hey, that's my take on it, short-term and long-term. What are your thoughts? I think you're spot on there. We need to not conflate the short-term challenges of jobs and uh, autonomous weapons arms races and stuff with these longer-term things. I think that uh, there's been so much talk about AI destroying jobs and enabling new weapons and stuff, ignoring what I think is the elephant in the room that's maybe a few decades out. You know, what will happen once machines are smart, outsmart us at uh, everything? And yeah, you know, a few decades might sound like a long way, but we actually plan for our retirement, even if it's decades away. We actually worry about climate change, even if it's even farther away. So it would be pretty irresponsible if we're just completely going to refuse to talk about this, which I think is ultimately the biggest change that's ever going to happen to life on Earth. Okay. Well, let's break it now. Uh, break it down. When you talk to students at MIT, they're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and they have all this enthusiasm, and then they say to you, well, gee, professor, my job, my future job, my dream job, am I going to be replaced by a machine? So what do you tell students when they ask you what jobs and what areas will flourish in the future, and which areas are doomed for extinction, like the blacksmith of old? The advice I give is that, that to safeguard your career, you should go for jobs that machines are bad at, <clears throat> involving people, involving unpredictability and, and creativity, which means avoid careers that are about to get automated away soon, like careers involving repetitive, structured actions in a predictive setting. So don't become a telemarketer, a warehouse worker, a cashier, train operator, baker, line cook, that kind of thing. I would also stay away from becoming a truck driver, bus driver, taxi driver, Uber driver, <clears throat> at least for the long term, because they're also on the chopping block, I think, within a decade or so. And, uh, and then there are also a number of other professions 
where even though they're not going to be on the endangered list for full extinction anytime soon, they're getting a lot of their tasks automated, so there's going to be much less demand. For example, paralegals, credit analysts, loan officers, bookkeepers, tax accountants. We're just not going to need nearly as many of these, which means lower salaries, harder to get a job there. Okay, and some people say that one of the big losers uh, with the digitization of our society is middlemen. Uh, middlemen, because uh, middlemen are involved in inventory, bean counting, and computers can do that. Like uh, stockbrokers, for example. You can buy stock on your wristwatch. So why do you need a stockbroker if you can buy stocks on your wristwatch? So if you are a middleman, don't you have to provide skills and services that humans desire, like creativity, innovation, experience? Uh, otherwise, you're going to be out of a job. What are your thoughts? I think that's exactly right. I think it's also important to get away from this oversimplified idea that it's just jobs that require a PhD that are going to survive and everything with less education goes away. There are a lot of jobs like massage therapy, for example, or psychiatrists or priests, where people actually prefer getting the service from a human over a machine and are willing to pay a premium for that. So those are jobs that are likely to stay with us for a lot longer, even though they might not require nearly as long an education as becoming some super hotshot computer programmer. Right, and also uh, semi-skilled jobs. Uh, robots can't pick up garbage. Every piece of garbage is different. They can't solve a crime. Uh, they can't build a skyscraper. So if you are a gardener, if you are a construction worker, if you are a sanitation worker picking up garbage, uh, robots won't be able to replace your job for several decades. So uh, semi-skilled jobs, uh, what are your thoughts? Those jobs like a plumber, uh, a contractor, a handyman, uh, robots can't do any of that stuff, right? What are your thoughts? That's a good point. So if you have any of those jobs, I think it's also important to uh, work with the technology, not, a, not to resist it. So if robots start to become able to do some of the things you do, well, start using them to work for you. You know, If you're a your plumber, get your whole accounting system running on your cell phone so you don't have to spend your time doing it. That way you can make more money and have more customers. If any other part of what you do can be automated by the little thing that automates it for you and then you're going to be able to thrive more. Doctors, for example, can, can treat more patients better if they have AI systems doing the radiology analysis for them. Lawyers can do more stuff if, if AI systems can repair the case by plowing through vast numbers of documents to help make the case as well as possible. Um, because they are using the technology to work for them. You have to avoid precisely <laughs> those parts then that, um, that the lawyers will have automated. Like That's why becoming a paralegal is so treacherous, or to become that the radiologist. Generally, if you, if you have a job where you spend your whole day looking at data on your screen, like CAT scans or whatever, and you keep pressing buttons <laughs> with your analysis and you never meet any humans and it's just the same thing over and over, then it's time to think about a career change. And if you are a middleman, if you are a broker, it seems to me that you have to provide skills that robots cannot provide, like interacting with humans. Uh, I, humans are, are very good at talking to other humans, but robots are awful when it comes to chit-chatting and, and just you know shooting the breeze with ro with uh, between robots and humans. And so it seems to me that uh, that jobs that involve interface with humans, uh, like you know guiding them through a store and products and providing advice to them, uh, those jobs will survive intellectual capital, in other words, rather than commodity capital. So it seems to me that the capital of the mind uh, will still survive. Uh, even though the price of commodities begins to drop, and even though repetitive work begins to be automated, it seems to me that uh, those jobs that involve uh, interaction with humans are going to survive. What are your thoughts? Yeah, certainly, at least until superintelligence, you know, for the next couple of decades, I, w I think those jobs will be fine. Most people would much rather have get a massage from a human than a robot. I would certainly much rather be married <laughs> to a human <laughs> than to a robot or have a 
I have a daycare teacher for my kids who is a human rather than a robot. Okay. Now, let's fast forward the dial. Now, let's jump a few decades in the future. We can always debate how far in the future we should go. But what about the singularity? We had Ray Kurzweil on the air, and he was more um, optimistic about how we would negotiate the time when robots are smart or smarter than us. So here's the question. The singularity. When do you think it'll happen, if at all? And will it be for the good or the bad? First of all, the question of when is, is really genuine controversy because there are AI industry leaders and and top researchers that I trust well who think it's not going to happen for 100 years, like Rodney Brooks, and then there are many others who think we're just decades away, including the leadership of companies like Google DeepMind. So we have to accept that we we honestly don't know. In terms of whether it's going to be good or bad, I don't like this attitude of sitting around and asking, oh, what is going to happen? As if it's somehow predestined. You know, it's not like we're being invaded by aliens who just have the superior technology and we have no impact on the outcome. We're creating this stuff, Michio, right? So we should ask ourselves instead, what can we do right now to make sure it becomes a good thing? rather than a bad thing. And I think there are a lot of concrete things we can talk about that we can do there. But I want to, first of all, say, I think there's been so much Hollywood bluster equating AI with doom just because it sells better. Uh, and we should remember that everything we love about civilization is the product of intelligence. So if we can amplify our own intelligence with artificial intelligence, it really is to enable humanity to flourish like never before. Think about the problem that we're stumped by today and haven't managed to solve properly, like climate, like poverty, social justice, curing all our diseases, and so on. In every case, we, in every case, we're stumped on these because we haven't been smart enough to solve them yet. And if we can amplify our own intelligence with machine intelligence, we have great potential. Okay, Max, we're going to have to take a short commercial break. But after the break, we're going to continue a discussion of his latest book, Life 3.0. Once again, our special guest today is Professor Max Tegmark, Professor of Physics at MIT. And we're talking about artificial intelligence. After the break, we're going to talk about, well, what happens when the robots are smarter than us. Will that, act, <clears throat> will that actually happen? Or is it simply fiction coming from the overheated imagination of Hollywood scriptwriters? Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Today we're talking about some things that some people think are perhaps the most important discussion that faces humanity. That is, how smart are robots going to become? And what do we do about it? With us today is Professor Max Tegmark, Professor of Physics at MIT, President of the Future of Life Institute, author of Our Mathematical Universe, and his latest book. His latest book is called Life. 3.0, being human in the age of artificial intelligence. So the first question for you, Max, uh, we talked about, well, we talked about jobs. We talked about opportunities that are going to be uh, revealed by artificial intelligence. But some people are worried. What happens when intelligent machines become, well, as intelligent as us? So first of all, do you think it's going to happen? Some people say it'll never happen. Some people say it'll happen by, what, 2045 or so? Uh, first of all, do you think it's going to happen, and what should we do about it? Many of my uh, AI research colleagues who are focused specifically on trying to build these things think it is going to happen in a few decades, and I think they're probably right. I think it's probably going to happen. There's certainly nothing in the laws of physics saying it won't, and I think technology is going in that direction. Now, how, what can we do to make it a good thing, not a bad thing? Hollywood movies, of course, scare us by making us fear that somehow machines should become conscious and evil and decide to kill us, like in Terminator or whatnot. But that, I think, is a red herring. What we should really worry about is not malice, 
but competent. So, so for example, Michu, do you hate ants to the point that you would like go out of your way and step on them if you see one on the Manhattan sidewalk? Well, not particularly, unless they get in the way or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, but suppose you're in charge of this awesome new green energy project, and just before you uh, flood this dam that's going to power the hydroelectric turbine, you notice, oops, there's an ant hill in the middle. What are you going to do? Well, turn the dial and let it flow, I suppose. I mean, you're too bad. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's that, so you didn't kill the ants because you're evil and have any antipathy against them. You just didn't have your goals fully aligned with the goals of the ants. And you were smarter than they were, so you got your way. Too bad for the ants. What we really need to do with AI is just make sure that we don't end up in the situation of those ants. We need to make sure that AI's goals are aligned with ours. And that is actually a fascinatingly challenging um, technical problem that we need to work on more. For example, if you take uh, a future self-driving cab out to a JFK and you ask it to get you there as fast as possible, and then you end up at the airport covered in vomit and chased by helicopters and you, like, and you tell it, no, 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 that's not what I wanted. And it responds, that is exactly what you asked for, Michio. Then you would have confronted exactly this problem that it took you literally, but it didn't do what you really wanted because you also had additional goals that it didn't understand. And we know how hard it is for even to get our human children to understand our goals. And we need to work much harder on making machines to understand what we really want. Then we need to also figure out how to make machines adopt our goals, which I still haven't fully really succeeded with, with my teenage intelligences, right? And finally, we need to figure out how to make machines retain these goals as they get ever smarter. Our kids often change their goals as, as they grow older. So we can be, so that we can trust that no matter how smart these machines get, they're going to treat us well. Uh, and that's clearly something which is possible in principle. Babies who are, who are six months old are not as intelligent as their parents, but they're fine because their parents' goals are aligned with the, those of the baby. Okay, Max, we're going to have to take yet another short commercial break. But after the break, we're going to continue discussion of perhaps one of the most existential questions of all time. Are machines, what happens if they approach human intelligence, or even exceed human intelligence. With us today, once again, is Professor Max Tegmark, Professor of Physics at MIT. The book is called Life 3.0, Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. In this hour, we're talking about the existential question, how smart should our machines become? With us today is Professor Max Tegmark, author of the book, Life 3.0, Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. Well, Max, let me ask you a simple question. First of all, who funds artificial intelligence? Uh, well, the Pentagon. And does the Pentagon build robots to be nice to our enemies? No. The Pentagon is entrusted to kill our enemies. And so given the fact that the Pentagon funds the huge bulk of artificial intelligence research, uh, there is in the West a propensity to build killing machines. Now, in Asia, it's the opposite. In Japan, for example, we have the Shinto religion, which believes that everything has a spirit in it. There's an animism in Shintoism, and therefore children love robots because they think that, well, robots are alive because there's a spirit everywhere in the Shinto religion. And therefore, children, instead of running away from Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, they love robots in Asia. But what are your thoughts? Are we going to go the way of the Pentagon, or are we going to go the way of loving the spirit inside our robots? <laughs> I very much hope we're going to go the loving uh, collaborative route. In fact, it turns out that even though the Pentagon is indeed spending more money probably on AI right now than the civilian industry in the West, it's the civilian sector that's produced the vast majority of the breakthroughs so far. They have been much more successful in recruiting the most talented researchers so far. And, and there's a fascinating battle really shaping up between the civilian AI industry, companies like Google and all, and all the others on one hand, and the military lobbyists on the other, where... where we actually organized, my colleagues and I, an open letter. We, we got vast numbers of AI leaders 
saying we do not want this wonderful technology that can make life so much better bastardized and mainly used to start an arms race, new ways of killing people. Uh, in November, there's going to be a, a United Nations meeting where people will be discussing whether one should ban killer robots in the same way that we've banned biological weapons and chemical weapons and try to curtail an arms race. At the same time, as you are well aware, it's really tricky to storm up stop arms races. I think the best time to stop one is before it's really started. And I, I have some hope here because ultimately if we get an out of control arms race going and kill a robot, it's actually going to weaken the US and China and Russia and all other powerful nations at the expense of ISIS and various rogue terrorist and non state groups. Because these are not going to be expensive weapons like hydrogen bombs. Re required expensive and difficult to acquire raw materials, they're going to be super cheap, like Kalashnikovs and Vans. And once superpowers, if they are stupid enough to figure out how to mass produce these, they will be everywhere on the black market. And, and it's going to be as hopeless to stop them as a Kalashnikov. You might have bumblebee-sized killer drones that you can just program in whoever you want to assassinate or the ethnic group you want to assassinate, and they'll do it without any, in any way being traceable back to you. It's going to be a horrible situation that the superpowers really, I think, want to avoid. Now, if you're top dog, if you have, then if it ain't broke for you, don't fix it, right? So I'm cautiously hopeful that we can rein in this crazy uh, attempt to start an arms race in this and keep AI focused on being the most beneficial positive technology ever. Okay, now on the air, we've had a number of people talk about the future of AI. Uh, some people welcome it. Uh, they say they are our evolutionary successors. They deserve to take over the world. We're the archaic ones, and so we should treat them as our children. And therefore, don't be afraid of the robots if they put us in zoos and throw peanuts at us and make us dance behind bars, because that's the way of evolution. Then we had another group of people who say, bah, humbug, we should create robots that eventually we will merge with them. Why not become Superman? Why not become super powerful? Why not become super intelligent? Merge with our creations. Well, we have to take a short commercial break. But after the break, let's talk about the far future. Should we welcome robots taking over and putting us in zoos? Or should we merge with them? Or should we ban them? We'll talk about that. us today is Professor Max Tegmark. He's a professor of physics at MIT, president of the Future of Life Institute, author of Our Mathematical Universe, and the book we're talking about today is called Life 3.0, Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. So Max, let's now turn the, the fast forward dial way into the future and talk about, well, the distant future now. Some people say uh, that we should welcome our robots as our evolutionary successors. They are our children, and if they replace us, well, so much for the better. Maybe that's the way of evolution. That's the way it should be. Other people say, oh, my God, that's horrible. But if the robots become very smart, instead of competing with them, why not merge with them? Uh, Professor Rodney Brooks uh, former head of the AI laboratory at MIT, says, don't be afraid of robots. Right now, they're pretty stupid, in fact, but eventually we will merge with them. So what are your thoughts about the far future now? I, th I really like your metaphor there, about us as a civilization giving birth to future life with uh, us as individuals giving birth to a child. Of course, if, if, we, you, if we individually have a child who can go out and fulfill our what wildest dreams and supersede them, do all these things that we wish we could have but weren't able to, and carries on our values and makes us, then we will feel really proud and happy about this, even if they outlive us, right? 
if, on the other hand, our kid turns out to be the next Adolf Hitler and murders us and then screws up the rest of humanity, we would feel less pleased. And we don't just sit around and, and say, well, I hope my child is going to turn out to be the nice kind, not the Adolf kind. No, we put a lot of effort into ed- educating our child, into raising our child to make it be the way we hope. And that's exactly the attitude I would like us all to have also about, in- about artificial intelligence in the future. Not sit around and passively twiddle our thumbs and wonder what's going to happen, but ask, what can we do to steer things in a good direction? to make sure oh. that these machines learn our values and, and whose values should they be and what kind of future do we want? Because if we have no clue what we want, we're much less likely to get it. And I'm a little bit upset, actually, because I feel optimistic that we can create a great future with AI if we really do our homework now and do a lot of AI safety research that's required. But the government to fund this research into making AI more powerful, generally are hardly funding at all the, the sorely needed research we need to keep it safe and beneficial. And I, I think AI safety research just needs to be recognized as something important that we should really prioritize. Okay. Now, we've had also some people on the air talk about friendly AI, that they agree with you that goals can be programmed into robots instead of the goals of the Pentagon. Why not create from the very get-go, from the very start, a whole new architecture called friendly AI, where the goals of the robots are to help people rather than replace them or murder them or push them out of the way. And this is a new orientation. Instead of killing robots that can kill people on the battlefield, from the very start, program into robots the fact that they are friendly. So what are your thoughts about friendly AI? I'm very sympathetic to the, uh, to the vision. But the devil is in the details, and we need to solve a lot of technical problems to actually make this work. And so, in other words, I think we can create a great future if we, uh, with friendly AI, if we can win this race between the growing power of AI and the growing wisdom with which we manage it and keep it friendly. I don't think we should try to stop this in any way the, the growth of the technology as it gets more powerful. And even if we wanted to, we couldn't. Instead, I would like us to really invest in, in the other competitor in this race, the wisdom, and fund a lot of those talented people around the world who want to figure out the nuts and bolts of how to make AI friendly, how to make it learn and adopt and, re- and retain our human goals so that we can actually do what we want. So okay. We, and for and recently, we had uh, Dr. Seth Shostak on the air, and he talked about reaching uh, out in outer space to make contact with intelligent life forms via radio. And he had this uh, existential shock himself when he realized that if in outer space we encounter a robot species, they're not going to use radio at all. Uh, everything will be digitalized, and we could be barking up the wrong tree trying to find intelligent life in outer space, assuming they are biological like us. Maybe they're not biological. Maybe they're totally digital, in which case we're barking up the wrong tree with SETI and the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, what are your thoughts if one day we encounter ro- uh, intelligent life in outer space and they're totally robotic? What are your thoughts? I think this is exactly what would happen. We, from a cosmic perspective, where we're in this universe that's 13.8 billion years old, the 100,000 years of human history is just a blink of an eye. And uh, it would be very unrealistic to assume that 100,000 years from now, life on Earth will be precisely like today. I think either it will have gotten much more sophisticated or we will have simply wiped out through our own stupidity. And therefore, if we find other life out there in space, we're very unlikely to find them in that very brief transition period from uh, unable to do anything with technology to something much more advanced. So we should be very humble and not just assume that we're going to find stuff like find life like us. Okay, but what about Rodney Brooks's point of view? Is that in the future we will, in some sense, be Superman? We'll merge with our creations. We'll be part cybernetic. We have already have cochlear implants. We'll have uh, retinal digital uh, technology. We have uh, just about uh, 15 seconds left. So yes or no, do you think that one day in the future we will merge with our machines or be separate? 
I think it's quite possible that it'll happen. But ultimately, again, I don't think the most interesting question is to speculate about what will happen, but to figure out what we want to make happen and what we can do today to make it so. Okay. Well, what you can do in the audience is get a copy of the book. The book is called Three Life 3.0, and it's by Max Tegmark, professor of physics at MIT, author of the book Our Mathematical Universe. Well, once again, you've been listening to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. 